Okay, board members, we are going to uh, begin our our study session. I I think a couple board members might be jumping back in. I think um, under 6.1 Money Management Act, where it's our pleasure to have Treasurer uh, David Damshin here and and staff uh, to talk to us about the Money Management Act, and so. We'll turn the time over to you, but if you, there's a button there on that mic somewhere that you need to push, and once you push it, then I get to click here, and now it's now you're live. So we'll, turn, we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Chair Huntsman. Uh, David Damption, State Treasurer. Good to be with you all this afternoon. It's, I was just told that I'm the last thing on the agenda. Is that right? That is correct. Should I start by saying are there any questions? <laughs> and if not, um, seriously, um, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk to you. I have a somewhat expanded agenda, but I'll move as quickly through it as I can. The Money Management Act is included, but um, it's important to me that we touch base periodically on matters of shared responsibility. And uh, there's a few such things that I wanted to, to touch base with you on today. Um, also included in those those issues for conversation, uh, Mr. Jones had indicated that there was interest in talking about HB 404, so I have that on the uh, on my list of things to talk about as well. So I'm prepared to do that with y'all. Um, let me mention uh, Brittany Griffin is my public information officer, and behind me I have Alan Rollo, the state investment officer, uh, and Michael Green, our assistant attorney general. And um, I didn't warn them that I might drag them in today. So if you've noticed, they're inappropriately attired. <laughs> it's my fault. Um, we, we knew you were coming, and so we have one of the best from the Highway Patrol, Officer Selleck. Is, is that right? <laughs> they appreciate. Hey, that's my that's my buddy back there. Yeah. He's our buddy. He's yeah, our he, buddy now. He has an Maybe essential. Maybe we can share buddies. He's conflicted. <laughs> is he? Yeah, I think he loves me more than you. Okay. Am I right? <laughs> oh, there he, you knows, go. he knows where all the money sits. Yep. <laughs> I don't always pull that card out right up front, but uh, sometimes it's convenient. Um, really quickly, um, I wanted to give a, again a quick overview, and, and then after talking a little bit about <clears throat> my background and what we do in the treasurer's office, uh, talk about the specific ties uh, to areas of your focus over oversight and responsibility. Uh, Constitutionally, I'm the, the custodian of public monies. And if you look in UCA 67-4, there are certain specifics related to the treasury operations of the state that are outlined there. But uh, in a nutshell, I'm the custodian of public monies. That, that has a fairly broad definition. Operationally speaking, uh, I'm going to describe what the treasury function is. Um, it's, you're not alone if, if, if you were asked to describe what exactly is the treasury function. How does it differ from accounting or, or controller or comptroller? Most people wouldn't know how to answer that. This outline of what the treasury function is, uh, during, uh, let me give you a quick background. My, deg my degree is in finance. I spent about 20 years in the banking industry. Um, combination of uh, management development, retail branch manage management, treasury management, which is a part of the industry that deals with large institutional clients and, and pay electronic uh, payment uh, technologies and so forth. And then I spent several years in, in an area called institutional trust and custody, where you work with large institutional investors that use multiple money managers and broker dealers, wherein you need to settle your securities and trades to a single repository. So it's very technology intensive. Um, so I did those kinds of things in the banking industry before coming to the treasurer's office about nine years ago. <clears throat> I, I say all that because I want to point out that this quick run through of what treasury is uh, this applies not only to the Office of State Treasurer. This would be this would apply to my former clients, which would include Intermountain Healthcare, Starbucks, Boise Cascade, uh, and, and many others. So, Treasury starts with collections. How does the money come in the door? And that there's a lot of technology in that potentially. Of course, you go from the basics of checks to now electronified checks, and there's many ways that electronified checks can be collected or received. Uh, credit card payments, etc. Once the money is in the door, on the other end of the spectrum, you have how do you push it out the door? And again, there are many methodologies this day and age for dispersing funds, paper and electronic. And um, so we work closely with the banking industry to implement 
efficient, secure technologies that, that make the processing of very large volumes of collection transactions and disbursement transactions efficient and low cost and secure. In between collections and disbursements, you have banking and cash management. We, we manage about 150 bank accounts. We have four primary banking relationships of the state, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Zions, and U.S. Bank. So daily we concentrate balances into a concentration, concentration bank. We use a lot of technology to do this, and we have investment operations um, daily. And we have about 50 to $100 million that pass through the office. And then borrowing, when the legislature authorizes bonds for things like expanding I-15 south to Utah County, if you're sensitive to that right now. I don't even live down there and I'm sensitive to that right now. Uh, or the new prison that we're all excited about. Um, I'm issuing the, those bonds to fund those projects. So that in a nutshell is what we do in the Office of State Treasurer. This next slide takes those basic functions and then calls out some things that I want you to know about that tie to school districts and public education in Utah. Under banking and cash management, I'll just mention the Money Management Act and council rules, which we're gonna come back to later. This just governs what's legal for public entities to do with public funds in terms of banking and investments. And one of my employees in the Office of State Treasurer is serves as staff to the Money Management Council. The Money Management Council provides regular oversight um, monthly meetings and they monitor the degree to which public entities throughout the state are complying with provisions in the Money Management Act and rules of the Money Management Council. So we're plugged into that very tightly. The, uh, as state treasurer, I am the executive secretary without voting rights on the Money Management Council. And so my chief deputy attends those meetings. Those meetings always conflict with Utah retirement systems. Um, one of the other things I do as treasurer is I, ser I serve on 19 boards and commissions, including Utah Retirement Systems, Utah Housing Corporation, and many others. So I, I don't attend Money Management Council meetings in person. I did for seven years uh, during my time as chief deputy treasurer. Uh, so we have a lot of interaction with the council, and we're very deeply involved in the Money Management Act. We've actually amended the Money Management Act, I think about seven times in the last nine years due to, uh, you're probably at least generally aware that there have been massive changes in the financial markets and, and in the banking industry over the past 10 years. And so we, we amend the Money Management Act to help our system evolve along with those financial markets and, and that banking industry. So something we're very actively involved in I don't, are, are you all aware of statewide cooperative contracts? No, if, if there's only one of you shaking your head no, then it's really important to talk about it briefly. So a statewide cooperative contract is one where we at the state take the significant buying power that we have from a, a volume and scale standpoint. We take that volume and scale to the market through transparent procurement, RFP, and we bid for services wherein we, we in place a contract and we advise the vendors through the bidding process, we're gonna have a, an open door. And that, that open door is available to all local governments of the state that are handling public funds. And so on the merchant services side, merchant services is credit card processing and online payment processing. So uh, my office led uh, the most recent, I guess about two years ago, procurement for merchant services of the state. This contract covers about a billion dollars a year in payments, 700 million or so in state payments and 300 million or thereabouts in local government payments. So it's important to know that schools and school districts or any other governmental entity that you have interest in or contact with understand that we have a screening deal for merchant services that's negotiated by the state and it's wide open and available to any public entity in the state uh, to take advantage of. On the other end, under disbursements, um, purchasing card is a disbursement tool. Its, its design is to minimize or eliminate fraud, uh, often associated with petty cash accounts or petty cash funds. If, if you or someone you know is an accounting nerd, you probably know about uh, petty cash, you probably know petty cash is a bad thing. And uh, 
purchasing card is a great way to eliminate petty cash if you're you're bold and so inclined. It's basically a credit card, but each merchant that accepts a credit card has what's called a uh, merchant category code or MCC. It tells the payment system, here's who we are and what we're selling. Groceries, clothing, or alcohol, pornographic material, et cetera. So, Obviously, for businesses and governmental entities, it's good to have something that places limits on how credit cards are used. You probably followed the fraud that occurred at Utah Communications Authority a couple of years ago, upwards of a million dollars. And that was just a general so-called corporate card that could be used for virtually anything. And it was used for virtually anything. The way that that fraud was perpetrated is um, counterfeit statements were created using de desktop publishing software. The important thing about a purchasing card, if it's used properly, is uh, it will typically come, particularly the state's contract, which is with U.S. Bank, comes with very robust online administrative capabilities and controls and reporting. And so if you're using online tools, uh, you can much more effectively control fraud than anything or process that's paper-based. So any questions on those statewide cooperative contracts? I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that we do these kinds of things at the state level to provide a service uh, and a benefit to local governments, in, including school districts. Any questions from board members? Okay. All right. We have um, one. Oh, yes. David, I'm sorry. I'm slow on the trigger here. Board member, uh, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. So those cooperative contracts, do each individual LEA, do they, they are the one that walks through the door and enters into that contract, or does the USBE enter into that contract in, on behalf of? What's an example of something that may, uh, LEA may use that for? Each LEA would separately. Um, I assume each LEA has its own federal federal tax ID number, and then they use unique accounts, right? So that's that's the driver. There's a simple participating entity addendum that they would execute to join that contract and it's very simple to do and so if there are questions or inquiries from LEAs that want to pursue this they can contact my office or the state's division of finance um, to set something like that up but it would be the the LEA directly on the bottom under investing I'll start with that you may be aware we run a state investment pool called public treasures investment fund or PTIF that invests state and local government funds, uh, public funds only. There's about $15 billion in that pool. Uh, it's a daily liquidity type of a thing. It's available to any public entity in the state that wants to use it. And I think most, if not all, school districts use it. We have about 500 distinct local government clients that are investing in the PTIF. I haven't done an, an analysis to, to determine whether or not there are districts that are not taking advantage of it. but. It is far superior to any private sector alternative. Um, if you, the private sector alternative, and we don't compete with the private sector. This is something that was created as a government service. It just happens that since we don't have a profit motive, um, private sector alternatives would be things called institutional money market mutual funds. And those typically charge about, at, at best, 14 basis points or 14 one hundredths of a percent. We charge one half of 1% against the PTIF, so it's exponentially cheaper in terms of the management and administration costs. And then the Money Management Act, which we manage the PTIF in full compliance with the Money Management Act, and the act gives us a degree of latitude uh, and flexibility in how we invest it. And um, it's very beneficial in particular in this environment where interest rates are rising. About 80% of that portfolio is in um, LIBOR index floating rate corporate securities, which is a mouthful, I'm sorry. But the point is, as rates are moving up, 80% of our portfolio is tracking right with rates. So we, we have a great hedge, if you want to call it that, against rising rates with the way that that portfolio is invested. It's actually yielding over 2% right now, which compared with where rates have been, we call it nosebleed territory. You're not impressed. It's 2%. Trust me, that's a high rate. Um, as you know, uh, we also have SIPVO, the school and, institutional, uh, school and Institutional Trust Fund Office. I chair the board of trustees that oversees the investments of SIPVO. And of course, your LEAs, many or most, are under Utah Retirement Systems, and I'm on that board as well, on the investment side. 
borrowing, uh, you likely know that I administer a school bond guarantee program. So when school districts issue bonds, they submit to me a request for certificate of eligibility under that program. We issue the certificate that's provided to the um, rating agencies and that allows the district's bonds to be rated AAA just like the state. And that's, that generates significant interest cost savings for school districts. And then in 2012, um, there was a credit enhancement program created for charter schools. It's, it's different, it doesn't use a guarantee per se, it utilizes what's called a moral, uh, moral obligation pledge of the state to enhance charter school bonds. And it's not for all charter schools, it's for charter schools that are most seasoned and best managed, if you will. And I'll talk a little bit more about the credit enhancement program and the Charter School Finance Authority in a moment. The Utah Charter School Finance Authority is a conduit issuer of bonds. It's an alternative for charter schools that, that want to access the public municipal debt market. It's not required that a charter school use the authority. However, the vast majority of charter schools that want to gain access to the municipal bond market come through the authority. And then on the bottom there, um, Resolution of the legislature um, appoints the treasurer as the chair of the Utah Council on Economic and Financial Education. And um, that combined with my lengthy career in the banking industry um, provides for one of the most entertaining things that we do actually, and that's work with nonprofits and financial institutions to enhance financial literacy in Utah. And as well managed we, as we are fiscally, and as conservative as we are generally, there's a lot of room for improvement in the area of financial literacy, I think, as you all know. And so it's something that we're excited about and we enjoy um, um, working with. Quickly on the Charter School Finance Authority, uh, I chair the board. Uh, I'm joined by Scott Jones and Phil Dean. Having been Chief Deputy Treasurer for seven years, as I mentioned before, I've been working with this authority for nine years. This is the strongest board we've ever had. I can't say enough good about Mr. Jones and his diligence, his professionalism. Um, he, he's phenomenal and, and so is Mr. Dean. And so, um, Scott in the room. Oh, Is his face turning the same color as his shirt and tie? Um, I, I, uh, he is, he's amazing and please, please, please keep him around. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm sorry to be self-serving. Um, to date, since the Charter School Finance Authority was created in 2007, uh, we've done 59 transactions totaling 737 million. I joined the office in 2009, so I haven't been party to all of those, but uh, uh, substantively most of them. Since the creation in 2012 of the credit enhancement program, we've done 19 credit enhanced transactions totaling 305 million. There's a cap on uh, the credit enhancement program. It's dynamic. We, we recalculated each year. The January 2017 cap was 424 million. We just recently uh, recalculated the 2018 cap and it's 456 million or something along those lines. Point being there's ample headroom still. Um, for additional credit enhanced charter school bonds. I met yesterday with the state charter school board and I just wanted to make sure that um, I kind of brought them up to date on, oh yes, Chair. Okay, one sec, um, board member Cannon. As, when you were talking about chairing the, the SITFO group, I, it just sparked uh, a question in my mind. So I know that uh, an awful lot of, of what goes on to build money in, in that uh, entity for our school children it comes from oil and gas. And oil and gas has, has fallen off. So I just wondered if you could comment on how they're doing and what the status of oil and gas is in, uh, in that entity and, and how they're overcoming the downturn of it. And it, will you just give us kind of a status update? I can give you a little bit, but not a lot because most of the oil and gas exposure, the vast majority is through CITLA. And historically up until HB 404, um, I, I have very limited um, cause for um, monitoring CITLA or being involved in, in CITLA. 
within CITFO, um, we have a very diversified portfolio and there is recognition amongst the trustees and staff within CITFO that we don't want to build out an investment portfolio that extends or, or amplifies our exposure to oil and gas. And so within the asset allocation, there is a, um, a re we don't have an oil and gas allocation per se. We have a, a real assets bucket, which has a 20% target allocation. Within that 20%, we have 3% uh, to TIPS or Treasury uh, uh, Inflation Protected Securities. Um, public real assets, there is a MLP, uh, Master Limited Partnership Income Fund. That's MLPs are generally gas, uh, gas pipeline type companies. So that's an oil and gas exposure. That's target allocation of 4%. And then uh, there's a 9% allocation to private real estate, which is just diversified multifamily, industrial, commercial, retail, et cetera. So there can be as much as 7% um, uh, allocated to public real assets, but that won't necessarily be oil and gas. So hopefully that gives you some indication that we're not going to overexpose to oil and gas within the investment portfolio. Again, recognizing we have plenty of exposure uh, to that with CITLA. Are there any other questions? And I apologize for talking so fast, but it is Friday afternoon and I'm the last thing on the agenda, so. I think, you know, I think you're doing great. I'll, I'll keep watching my light. To okay. All right, thank you. Um, so charter school finance issues that um, we, we have some concern over, and these are things that I'm sure that are on your radar, but I just wanna make sure we have a, at least a brief meeting of the minds here, and if you have any questions or comments on these issues that you let me know. Um, Historically, we don't see charter schools seeking access to the public municipal bond market until they've been in existence for five years, give or take. And early in the evolution of charter schools in Utah, there was limited competition. There was um, inconsistent levels of service quality and inordinately high fees. And that's in some ways a reflection of the disorganized nature of the market, um, lack of competition, et cetera, uh, and the risk that's involved in something that's brand new. And so over time, um, we have better competition, lower fees, higher levels of professional competency. That's good. When a transaction comes to us for bonding, it's we're, again, five or more years beyond the point where the school entered into a contract with the developer to build the school in the first place. And we've said many times, you know, a lot of the biggest damage that's done financially to a school can be done uh, if, if those contracts with developers are um, overly favorable to the developer and not so much to the school. So that's, that continues to be a concern for us. It's not something that we have any control over, um, but it's something that we're mindful of. And it's something that we're hopeful that, that this board and the state charter school board are, are, are looking at and, and managing to the best of their ability. Post issuance compliance has to do with after a school issues bonds, it has obligations to its investors and to um, the charter school finance authority um, for, well, and to the Internal Revenue Service for tax compliance matters and disclosure matters. And given the nature of charter schools, uh, the volunteer boards, turnover on the boards, and the complexities attendant to municipal bonding, there's a little bit more risk here than with many uh, public entities that, that get involved with municipal bonds to, to see some of these post issuance compliance requirements missed or dropped or delayed. And so when we have applications that come before us now, um, we fairly, consistency see, fairly consistently see um, deficiencies in this area. It's something that we're working hard to educate on. I, I just met with the Utah Association of Public Charter Schools and a number of uh, charter school administrators and, and so forth late last year to do a, a training on this. We're developing a charter school finance authority website and we'll have some training materials there as well. And we're also working on putting a post issuance compliance monitoring function within uh, my office. 
because we, my office is responsible for post issuance compliance monitoring for the state's bonds. And so uh, there's, it's a good fit. We've recently uh, changed my staffing model. We took a, what was a debt accountant in the Division of Finance, moved that position into my office, kind of upgraded it. It's called debt manager. And this person will have responsibility for a number of debt related things, but it will include post issuance compliance, not only for the state, but also for, for charter schools. So it'll give us kind of a belt suspenders if you will, on helping charter, helping charter schools to stay on top of these, you know, uh, mostly disclosure related, but these post issuance compliance requirements. Um, the next item, coordination with districts and encroachment. We, the, the last year or two, we've started hearing for the first time, charter school, hearing from charter schools that are indicating some, I don't know if threat's a good word, but some stress fiscal stress stemming from encroaching competition, either from other charter schools or from district schools. And that creates great concern for me. Um, we, together within the state, and this is charter schools, public schools, all of us, we want to vigorously protect our reputation and our credit overall. And we need to respect the investors that buy these bonds. If we don't, they'll stop investing in our charter schools. And so um, I understand that under, uh, under current state law, there's a prohibition on considering competitive factors when granting uh, a charter. Um, I think that's something worth discussing going forward. And I just want, want to put it out there that this is an issue. We're hearing it from charter schools and it's a credit risk and it's a credit negative for those charter schools. And uh, what we don't want to do is have a situation where our own public education system creates fiscal cannibalism. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Mark, can I make a comment here? Um, yes, you, you may. I'm sorry. I know I'm, you know, the great beyond or whatever. <laughs> so, well, but I, uh, I, I have had this concern for a while and it's not just charter schools, it's district schools that have that um, problem as well. My own neighborhood school is down to about 300 students, and we have a new charter school coming in across the street. So it causes a lot of stress for those schools and for people whose children are in those schools not knowing if there's going to be enough students there. And so I, I agree. I think it's something that maybe we need to talk about to the legislature and ask them if that's something we can revisit because um, I'm afraid we're going to have too many schools in in certain areas and not enough students. So, okay. thanks. I wrote a I wrote a note down on that, and and uh, the treasurer's nodding his head. So thank yeah. you. Well, and I want to say I understand that competition is an important reason why we want charter schools. We want charter schools to compete and innovate and so forth. So I don't want to suggest that I don't understand that, but I'm concerned about the free flow of capital in the public the public marketplace in Utah. And I just want to make sure that we're very respectful of our investors and we don't create problems that we can't manage through. And the last point is related, is resolution procedures and debt recognition. I think it's important that we all sort of know which charter schools have issued debt or borrowed money and where from, and it might not be through the authority, it might be through other uh, conduits, other local governments, it might be through the USDA or others. But we need to follow those situations. There was a situation, I, I don't remember the schools, uh, it was a couple of years ago where a school was failing and another charter school came in and took over and there was some controversy about what the board was told and whether or not it was accurate. And I would just tell you in that, Based on my discussions with the USDA, I was concerned about how the USDA and its investors were treated in that situation. We need to all work together, again, to make sure that we treat those representatives of the marketplace with great respect so that we can maintain this free flow of, of capital support for charter schools and, and district schools both. And so, um, I, frankly, if a charter school is failing and it's issued bonds, all I care is that we have students there long enough, and it's usually 30 to 35 years, 
to generate revenue sufficient to pay those bonds off. And I don't care if this charter school is taken over by another charter school or a district. I really don't care. But that needs to remain an educational facility, or we need to pay the bonds off outright. And that's usually, uh, on average, 10 to $15 million a pop. So uh, hopefully we have some procedures in place for struggling charter schools to make it a little smoother than the transaction I referred to and to ensure that participants like the USDA and others are, are treated with great respect and we have open channels of communication and transparency throughout the process. Um, I'll stop and ask, are there any questions? Um, any questions from yeah. board members? I just, I'm taking a few notes here and listing out your concerns. I'm, I'm sure the same concerns that Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones has with regarding what's happening in our charter school community on onboarding schools, offboarding, or their buildings, the dollars, and so I think some betterments are going to be coming forward to address. Mark, can I, can I make a follow-up? I, I want to clarify something. Okay, I'll yeah. pause on my comment and allow you to speak. Go ahead. Thanks. I'm so, it's really hard for me to tell when to when to interject. Um, so, as far as charter schools, I think charter schools are great, and I think that they do a lot of great things. I just um, am really concerned that we need to make sure, like you guys are discussing, that everything that that we're not over, first of all overbuilding, um, th that we have enough students to handle the, um, the the amount of building that we're doing. And I don't know that right now um, we're looking at that. Um, and, and, and maybe it's, you know, maybe others have a different opinion and that it's just kind of okay to have kind of a free-for-all. And then if, if one school, you know, if, if one area has too many schools, then we'll just get rid of some of those schools. But to me, it doesn't seem very fiscally responsible to taxpayers to build too many schools um, and then then have to get rid of some of the schools. So that that's my concern. It just seems to me like we need to hit, hit some kind of a balance. Okay. And it, it's nothing against charters because we have some great charters. I have some great charters in our neighborhood too. But I think we just need to hit that balance fiscally. Okay. Board Member Hansen, I'm, I'm making some notes of the – of the treasurer's concerns, we're, we're definitely not going to be able to expand on him in his presentation, but we certainly can um, bring him back if, if he's going to be part of our solution. So I, I ask you, I know you're busy with your grandchildren there, and I wish I was with mine um, and had, a, had this on speaker. No, I'm enjoying the conversation. But we, we are taking notes, and so we, and if you can do the same, that, that would be good as you're busy doing what you're doing there. But I just wanted to follow up as on, on this just a little bit, that as we're taking some of these notes, we're probably going to come back to you and, and get a f some further information from you to see where, where you're at and on some of these concerns than what you're presenting today. Well, absolutely. And one of the things that I'm trying to accomplish is uh, I've, we have, you can see based on this conversation and our prior conversation, we have a lot of overlap right mm -hmm. and i think that our constituents rightly expect that we and that's everyone in this room the governor's office the attorney general's office the state auditor's office everyone in in state government our constituents expect us to work productively together and and I, i've felt for years that that we need closer ties from the treasurer's office to this board and i appreciate you giving uh giving up the time and i'm happy to spend as much time with y'all as is needed to make sure we're uh, working together as, as productively as we can. So, um, if there are no other questions, I'll jump into the next couple of things here if okay. I could. The superintendent has a question or a comment. Oh, we've got several of them coming on. Superintendent. I, I thank you, um, Treasurer Damson. I appreciate the good working relationship that um, I feel like we've had, and you've been so great to. Um, invite us into your office and have conversations during the legislative session. So I just want to pu publicly acknowledge that you've been a really great partner and we appreciate um, the many times that we've had the opportunities to meet with you over various issues. And you've always been very collaborative, so thank you for that. 
My um, question is, when we go, when you were talking about this collaborative space and the importance of interagency, um, if not convergence, at least collaboration, how, how does the auditing function work with that in your office? So I, I thought you just had a couple of dollars in your pocket, and now we find out you have billions <laughs> that you oversee. So um, how does that function work in, for your office? I, I'm really unclear. I mean, I know we have audits that come to us legislatively from Auditor General. We have internal audit. What auditing functions do you have to oversee all of these dollars? We're subject, as you are, to the internal audit function of the Division of Finance, so we get those occasional um, requests from the Division of Finance. And then the Office of State Auditor has a team. Because of all that we do and the, the underlying complexities uh, and the, the underlying accounting of all that we do with the bonding and the investing and so forth and all, 150 bank accounts, the state auditor has a team that camps out in our office for, I want to say, about 90 days every year. Uh, we're a huge part of the state's financial audit, so we, we spend a lot of quality time with the Office of State Auditor, not just, not just the time that I spend driving around the state with the state auditor, but uh, that's a whole other topic. But um, yeah, it's robust as it should be. And we, uh, coming from the banking industry, um, I developed very early on a, a strong appreciation for examiners and auditors. A lot of people think auditors are bad, they don't like them and they don't want them around. I want them around as much as I can get them because as hard as we might work to manage internally and, and, and ensure that internal controls and separations of duties are adequate and so forth, um, it never hurts to have a second and a third and a fourth set of eyes on what we're doing, and especially with the amount of money that we're handling. So um, we have a robust audit process, and I'm happy that we do. Okay. Board, Board Member Ryan. Yes, thank you. Treasurer Damson, um, are you aware of a charter school that's ever been more than 30 days late on a debt payment in Utah's history? No. Is that luck or... Oversight? I mean, why, why is that? Why, why have they been so good so far? Um, if they're maintaining adequate enrollment and they're receiving revenues and they're managing their financial affairs adequately. Um, the other thing is all these bond issues are supported by a trustee. So the money is given to a trustee who is, will hold the money. Uh, all of these transactions include uh, a debt re service reserve, so it's usually referred to as MADS, Maximum Annual Debt Service. So you look at the single year of largest debt service, and so when a school issues bonds included in the proceeds that they receive from investors will be enough to cr set aside a debt service reserve equal to one full year of debt service. And so um, the trustee holds those monies, the trustee sends reminders to the charter schools, and uh, moves the money around on their behalf. So they have a lot of support as well in terms of the uh, management of bond proceeds with the trustee. Okay, thank you. It's all been good. Let's keep it that way. I agree. Okay. Uh, please continue. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention as briefly as I can SB 122. I don't know if how many of you had this track for you across your radar. Uh, I don't normally get involved in local issues. Um, this one I did for two reasons. One is it was uh, the clearest, uh, a, one of the clearest cases of right and wrong I'd ever seen uh, in terms of legislation. And it deals with some very arcane aspects of bonding that most people just really, really struggle to get their head around. And that includes, if I can say it, the majority of all legislators. And so I knew that to, to get this thing done, uh, that I and my staff would need to get behind it. All I want to say is this. This is a simple matter of transparency and honesty with the taxpayer. When you issue bonds, yes, you want to maximize investor demand, and that means you absolutely want to invite to the table um, investors that want large coupons and small coupons. That's just you know the, the interest rate that's attached to the bond, right? If you're a school district and your going market rate to borrow money at a given term is, say, 2.5%, and you have investors that come to the table and they say, hey, I want coupons on my bonds that will protect me from rising interest rates. 
so I want coupons or interest payments on my bonds above 2.5%. I want them at 5%, 4%. Why would a school district agree to pay anything above the going rate of interest? If your going rate, your going cost is 2.5%, you're not going to, right? You won't do it. You absolutely won't do it. But you want those investors to come to the table. They stimulate demand, which lowers your ultimate cost. Here's what you do. When that investor says, I want a 5% coupon, you say, okay, but you're going to have to give me enough extra cash up front with which I can pay you back with these artificially inflated interest rates because that's what they are, okay? And that's how it works. And investors are happy to do that. It's called premium. They say, I will give you the extra cash that you need so you can pay me back at 4 and 5%. I know it might, it might not make sense to you, but it's, it's, it's a common practice. It's been exceptionally common over the last decade. And you don't want to turn those investors away. You want them to come to the table, and you want the PAR investors. To, the PAR investors say 2.5%. Just give me the straight up, simple 2.5%. There were, in my mind, unscrupulous financial services providers using the complexities of this issue to confuse the heck out of school board members and legislators to oppose this bill. Um, I worked with Senator Stevenson and Representative McKay to um, support the bill, and fortunately it passed. It's the right thing to do. It's just if you've heard conversations or if you have questions about this, uh, we've passed out the, the handout that my office developed to help uh, advocate for support of the bill. And um, uh, if you have questions, I want to make sure that you, of all people, understand this issue because it affects, there's only, to my knowledge, a handful of school districts that were going down this road. And what they were doing in effect, the voters were approving, say, 200 million in borrowings. They were borrowing. 215 million, millions of dollars more than voters had authorized. How could they do that? A loophole in the law, which was solved by SB 122, and fuzzy, um, fuzzy encouragement or fuzzy lobbying from financial services providers that benefited from trying to carve out a, uh, you know, a um, strategic advantage. Hey, we'll do something really cool and creative and new. And you look like a hero because you'll get so much more done with your bond issue. Well, of course you'll get so much more done when you borrowed way more than voters told you you could. If that's your idea of looking like a hero, then fine. For me, that's it's absolutely intolerable. If a district needs more money to get projects done and they need to factor in inflation, fine. Tell voters how much you need and let them decide. It's all about transparency and fidelity uh, honesty with with the taxpayer. Yes, Chair Um Board Member Lisa Cummins has a question or comment. I was in a meeting, and uh, there was some stakeholders that were very much in favor of killing the bill, because they said this is best practice. This is it helps right. you know solve a lot of issues that they would have problems if if this didn't if 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 it passed and things. And I just sat there in awe of how much money the taxpayers were being <laughs> siphoned from. Money was being siphoned from. Okay. We also have Board Member Wright. Did you have a comment, question? Um, yes. The, there's been efforts in our state to put on the ballot an increase in the income tax rate to fund public education. And that's, that's absolutely a valid debate and, and worth having. But it seems like a lot of voters don't realize that they could raise property taxes at the local level and, and, and have more funding for school districts. Um, but a lot of times the school districts say, well, there's a cap on how much we can raise property taxes. And I'm sort of fuzzy on that. I maybe you understand it better and can explain. I mean, why do we prohibit, or what's the public policy behind limiting a school district's ability to raise property taxes if they want to spend more on education in their district. And I don't, I, I apologize, uh, board member Wright, I don't, I have no idea. I'm, I'm with you, uh, I'm fuzzy on it, I don't know. It just seems odd, I mean, you can raise t funding at the state level, but you can only raise it at the local level. And I think sometimes voters might be more receptive to that because they're not just paying for anything, they're paying for the schools in their community. All right, All right thanks. 
Please continue. Thank you. Really quickly, HB 238 was just kind of a cleanup bill. This was the second year in a row it was run and not passed. Um, I'm hoping next year the third time's a charm, and this just relates to the School and Institutional Trust Fund. I'll come back to HB 404 if I could. I just don't want to um, um, leave out the Money Management Act because I know that was a primary uh, issue of interest. So as I said before, the Money Management Act and rules of the council govern all banking and investment of public funds. There's a Money Management Council. It's uh, one but no more than two elected public treasurers, usually a county treasurer or more. One but no more than two um, appointed treasurer, which is generally a city treasurer. Uh, one but no more than two uh, members experienced in banking and one but no more than two experienced in investments. And so we have banker types and investment types and then we have public, public treasurers. Five members, um, they meet monthly. Most important for you to know, I think, because I know that there was concern about well, what is the board's responsibility and how might you, you know, become involved. Important to note, there's a deposit and investment report that every public entity is required to, to submit to the Money Management Council twice a year. And again, uh, one of my employees is staffed to the council and she monitors these reports. We're actually converting those reports this year. They've been paper and PDF based historically. We're implementing a, a Salesforce CRM solution so that they can be submitted going forward uh, electronically. So that'll clean things up and also give us much better access to data, not only for, for the Money Management Council, but the state auditor and frankly the state board if, they're, if you had interest in, in accessing that kind of data. So what school districts and other governmental entities are doing is monitored regularly by the Money Management Council. And so you wouldn't likely hear about things. Uh, and we've not seen compliance problems from the education community. Where we've seen compliance problems, it's been uh, special service districts, frankly. So uh, we've never, I, I can't remember having ever seen a compliance problem with, a, uh, with an LEA. Um, the next to the bottom bullet point just points out that the, the act um, outlines the types of institutions and professionals that public treasurers uh, can work with. Qualified depositories or banks or depository institutions which are, are legal to use, certified dealers or brokers from which public entities can buy investment products. Certified investment advisors, if, uh, if you're a public entity you have and you want to invest, you have two choices. And this is really the two choices you have as an individual. You can either direct, which means you have, you know what you're doing, and you have specific ideas and you want to buy certain investment products. That's directed. If you don't know and you just want to hire somebody to do it for you, that's, discre that's called discretionary. You're just saying, here, take my money and manage it for me. So certified dealers will accommodate public entities that want to have directed arrangements and certified investment advisors will accommodate those that want discretionary arrangements where they manage those investments for them in accordance with the Money Management Act. This is sort of um, a shopping list, if you will, or a menu of, of the primary securities that are legal for public entities to invest in. Let's see. You can see at the very bottom, that's the that's the type of security I mentioned is comprises about 80% of the PTIF is variable uh, variable rate corporate obligations or corporate floaters. So those are the types of things that, that public entities are allowed to invest in. And there's a framework for diligence and prudence in investing in public funds that makes clear that there's a hierarchical relationship between the three primary investment objectives that public entities, public treasurers uh, have. Safety of principle is number one, need for liquidity is number two, and yield is number three. And we emphasized this heavily in 2009 and 10 and 11 through the financial crisis because we did see a lot of instances of treasurers stretching for yield and, and taking on sometimes uh, somewhat uh, excessive, arguably excessive risk, I should say. Um, many of those risks have, have diminished, of course, at this point uh, quite significantly. Um, there is defined within the act a prudent person rule, and um, I won't go into that in any detail. I want to be able to get back to 
questions and concerns you might have about HB 404. And I, I think I'm at almost an hour. I, I haven't seen any any hardcore watch checking going on, but <laughs> it might be out of my line of sight. Well, well, maybe you can update us on what you've been doing on on HB 404. Really, just making sure we understand it uh, is is the most important thing. And Chair Huntsman, as, as you know, I, I met with you and, and Superintendent Dixon during the session. I, I, I just want to make sure everyone knows that, that this was not my agenda and I was neutral on it. I was neutral when it was first uh, announced to me and I remain neutral um, until we are at the point where action needs to be taken. And we're, we're at that point now, of course. We need to, um, with the July 1 effective date, I'll need to work with those um, appointing authorities that um, will put in place this um, uh, advocacy committee that oversees the office and puts forth to me the, the two optional candidates for the director position. So um, I just want to make sure really the only thing f for us at this point is to ensure that those appointing authorities are solicited for input or uh, appointments on July 1 or shortly after July 1. And all of the, the various tasks that have to be performed to put the office in place, or virtually all, are things that the new director would do, like the budget, like the rules, uh, things like that that are prescribed in, in the bill. Uh, those are things that, as I understand it, the new director would do and would pass to uh, the uh, the oversight committee, and then the oversight committee would pass to me, kind of a thing. So really, up until we get to July one, and we have the the appointments made for the oversight committee, uh, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Um, we're certainly working on officing. I talked to Representative Last, and I think his preference was that the office um, offices with mine or somewhere uh, similar. I don't know that I have any specific um, decisions made that way. We have office space available, not much, in the Capitol. And my unclean property division has office available as well. I think it would probably make more sense for the director to be up in the Capitol. But beyond that, I'm happy well, to. Just a, a couple things <coughs> regarding that. as we. As you are putting a framework and you're onboarding this new assignment that you have um, based on 404, you know we we still play a we we still play a role in it. Um, it's real important for us to know when, where, how. Be prepared because um, I don't think this is really important to us, even though um, we have less stewardship on this. And so whatever whatever. How, not whatever, when when you have um, a good pathway put together on this whole onboarding of everything you've got going on, um, it'd be nice for us to know about it. Yeah, I think the main thing, as I said, is um, so the um, we have a let's go back to that advocacy committee. We have two individuals appointed by the SITLA board, two, uh, one by the SITFO board one by the treasurer, and then we have the State Board of Education staff member who administers the school land trust program. So we'll want to know from this board who that person is. And of course, that's, an, that's one of the July 1 or shortly thereafter appointments. Um, that would be the main thing. And then any other thoughts, questions, concerns that this board has, that any of you have, uh, I'd love to hear from you and, and happy to talk to you about any of those. Um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just have one question. Over the years, that director position, when it was under the State Board of Education, has kind of been come to, been termed as the watchdog, right? And so they were meant, or at least that's what it felt like, they were meant to kind of oversee SITLA and SITFO and ensure that the beneficiary 
what needs or their interest was being met. And so under this new um, kind of structure, it feels a little different as CITLA and CITFO have, I don't know how to quite put it, but more advisory uh, role over this particular director position. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on what the actual function of this new director might be and what, you know, if they're not, they're, if they're no longer that watchdog, then what do you see them as, as being? Well, the way I read it, they're still the watchdog. Um, I understand what you're saying when you have this um, relationship between my office or, or the state treasurer and the director. Um, I'm always concerned about personalities or individuals, you know, when you, you run legislation and you say, well, this is the best person type of thing. Um, it happens that in my case, I had significant experience during my time in the banking industry with trust scenarios. I worked with pension plan clients and uh, defined contribution plan clients and um, uh, fiduciary investment scenarios uh, that was that was a big part of what I did during my career so the state treasurer will always have those uh, very extensive fiduciary obligations now is it possible that there's there's particular scenarios from the past and particular past candidates for treasurer that are brought up from time to time folks that maybe don't have that kind of background one of the things that I've said and I may have even said this to chair Huntsman and superintendent Dixon is if you come into the Office of State Treasurer and you don't understand the essence of fiduciary obligations, you'll learn quickly because you're an uh, ex officio member of the Utah Retirement Systems Board, you chair the CITFO Board, um, and there are many other aspects of fiduciary responsibility that are, that are uh, borne by the Treasurer. So I see I see the relationship between the treasurer and that watchdog as an important one and one of partnership to some degree, understanding that I'm, I'm one of those that's being watched. I'm fine with that. I guess I would point back to my comments about the state auditor and the relationship that we have. Um, we need those kinds of separations. The way that it was explained to me by the proponents for HB 404 is that this made sense to them and that adequate separations were created by virtue of this advocacy committee which has sort of shared oversight over the director, shared with the treasurer. How that's going to work in practice, of course, we'll learn over time. I did, I did get indications from the sponsor that he realizes this is a significant change and that there may be cause for fine-tuning adjustments down the road, and I'm always open to that. I want to make sure that it works well. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thank you, but I do have a follow-up based on that. And so I, I guess anytime something new, you have to kind of think about the scenarios of, of how would we or and, and as you establish those relationships. So if this director um, is being um, – Oversought is <laughs> being overseen by you know Sitfa, Sitfo, Sitla, and the treasurer's office and and um, the staff from State Board of Education. So if this director sees a problem in any of those organizations, how do they bring that to the attention of the group? What what would be the process of? Hey, we don't think Sitla is managing the lands properly and, and they're decreasing the amount of revenue possible for, for the children of the state. And so who would they go to if they're being overseen by that, in essence, by, by members of the CITLA board? Well, just to clarify, um, the advocacy committee does not, in, does not have on it members of CITLA board or CITLA staff or CITFO board or staff. The, these are um, appointees of those boards, right? So, um, and obviously there's a subject matter expertise um, focus there that they, they want, you want people that sort of understand what it is they're overseeing. Um, it's interesting. So that may be an open question to some degree. Um, when we had the Hunter Access issue uh, last year, I think it was last year, um, 
comments made at the SITFO meeting that caused great concern for me. I said, you know, if there's a cause for action on the part of the State Board of Education, the SITFO board may want to join them uh, if, if there's some form of action taken or <laughs> position taken. Um, I don't think that we were perfectly or fully informed as to what all had occurred. Um, I had a conversation with the governor's chief counsel and um, we weren't in the loop with those, most of the conversations were more on the SITLA side of things. So we were kind of tangential to it. In some ways I can see this being beneficial because this will bring me or whomever succeeds me into the loop on more of the full spectrum and SITLA. And so, but actually I don't think we'll really know until we start seeing some replayed scenarios but it, anytime there's a situation where I have concerns about uh, legal exercise of fiduciary duty, I'll be talking to my assistant attorney general right quick and the attorney general will be involved in those conversations right quick. And I'll be talking to the governor's office as well as I did last time. Um, I was concerned about this appraisal process and the valuation that, that came out of that but I've been told by the governor's office that in their view it wasn't a proper appraisal. I haven't explored it, but that's one of the things I'd kind of like to look into once we have this, this position in place and we have someone that can maybe revisit that issue and that'll give us sort of a, a baseline, if you will, uh, I think for how to proceed and probably help us answer your question a little bit more once we get to that point. I don't, there's not any other questions, so. Any other questions or comments? I you still have more that you want to, are you? Are you I want to point out that for those of you that want to know a lot more about the Money Management Act and rules of the Money Management Council, we have complimentary copies for you. We have eight actually. We don't have enough for everyone, but if, if any of you are nerdy enough, or I should say diligent enough to want to know more, we have copies and we're happy to share those with you. And if, if we don't have enough today, the reason we're, we're running so low is there, there were additional amendments to the Money Management Act uh, during the, this recent legislative session. And so we'll be having new um, amended copies of the act printed up probably in the June timeframe. So if you want the new act, we, and they're on, yes, they're online. If you go to the, my, the treasurer's website, the uh, rules of the Money Management Council and the Act both are online. Okay. Board Member Lisa Cummins has a question or comment. Just in June, when it's all streamlined together, maybe send out a link or a new copy um, options for them at that time. So sure. So we're not re wasting paper and money. And we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Well, Treasurer, I, I really appreciate you being here, and I, I'm not, I don't think I'm one of those nerdy types or anything but we do and I, and I think most of this board takes our fiscal responsibilities pretty seriously and and we definitely um, have a relationship with you and in uh, and how all of that works and that we do things right and etc so I, I appreciate you coming here and updating us on on this act and then also sharing some of your concerns that some of the things that we might move forward for betterments in, in, in our operations and um, look forward to continued good re relationship. You were um, during, during the legislative session, every time we needed to talk or wanted to talk, you, the, the door was open and so thank you for that. It's a very busy time. I um, appreciate your association with uh, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones and I know he's, he's gonna keep an eye on you. On. Absolutely. The other way? He's sitting right behind me. He's yeah. making me nervous. There you go. Um, board member Wright, any other comments <laughs> from, from the board? I, I think board member Wright's got one. Just, just a last comment. Uh, you have a unique perspective on things. We're state school board members. From a fiscal perspective, what are the top two or three concerns or trends you think we ought to keep in mind? You've told us so many good things. These are maybe the things that will stick. Charter schools are part of this. Um, we have so much growth in the state and such a strong economy and it's a good problem to have. But as you know, we're, we're pressed for infrastructure, for roads, 
Lake Powell pipeline, you know, water, the prison. And so how do we manage this? And this is so much of what you're dealing with, right? For, for you, it's enrollment growth and, and funding education properly, working with the legislature to fund education properly. How do we deal with this good growth and deal with, you know, do our job in terms of infrastructure and funding education uh, properly? Um, that's a big concern for me because we're going to be putting stress on the state's uh, debt levels and borrowing capacity and so that's a, a big issue for us in my office and I think it's a big issue for public education and has been. Um, that's the primary one. Um, obviously banking and investments is so much calmer now than it was when I first came into the office back in 2009 and 10. But there will be another recession we will have more shocks and so we don't want to be complacent so being fiscally attentive watching what's going on in, in the banking and investing realm is is critical because things are going to change it's pretty we're seeing increasing volatility in the equity markets of course but overall we're still on a pretty steady uh, stable climb in terms of the economy um, those are the main things that come to mind um, board member Lisa coming I was just going to say I I've been watching the markets as well, and I'm I'm not sure um, that it's going to be a steady climb in the f near future. I'm, there's there's everybody's getting nervous right now, and so are we preparing for a decrease, for a decline? You know, are we ready for that? Um, are we should we stop saying yes to so many bonds to so many? Um, Requests because I think there's going to be a huge correction coming. Uh, there needs to be a big correction coming, and it's going to hurt. Um, so I, so are, is the state prepared for that? I remember hearing that at some point uh, in appropriations that they were, um, but at the treasurer's level and and with Sitla and Sitfo, are we ready for that? Yeah, that's a good question. We, I believe we are. We have uh, stress testing discipline that was implemented in 2015 that is similar to the stress testing that financial institutions are mandated to do under the Federal Reserve. Um, we have healthy rainy day funds. Um, even though we are facing growing pressure for debt, um, we're managing it appropriately. We, we're one of only nine states rated AAA by all three rating agencies, and that's something we, we vigorously work to protect. Um, it's important to note that there's a, a there's the relationships between financial markets uh, and the economy, but they are distinctly different things. And so I understand when you're, what you're saying when you talk about imminent correction, um, but that won't necessarily imply um, a change in, in economic uh, direction um, at the same time. But you always invest for the long term, mindful that these things are going to occur and that they are inevitable. And that's why you, you, um, implement disciplines like um, diversified <laughs> portfolios and that you have um, risk focused components in your investments that are built to be shock absorbers you know against uh, economic and, and market disruptions Can Can I follow up? Follow up? Um, where do you see um, the state going with maybe Bitcoin or blockchain um, securities and things like that do you see that going forward so Bitcoin is a virtual currency. Um, it is not an investment. Um, if you buy Bitcoin, uh, it's it's fine to, if you want to buy Bitcoin personally. Um, just realize that it is is a speculation, not an investment. Um, we are not doing anything with Bitcoin at present. There have been questions about can we receive payment in Bitcoin, and also over the years, can we receive payment in gold and silver? The problem is. We have to rebuild our, I mentioned there's a lot of technology in both disbursements and collections, and we have to constantly advance our technologies to meet the masses, if you will. And so governments over the years started accepting credit cards, although we take that for granted now. Governments started taking payments over the Internet years ago. We take that for granted now. We're, right now we're focusing on where are the masses. Um, it's those things. It's mobile payments, things like that. Those that come to us and say, I'd really like to pay Bitcoin or gold and silver, such an incredibly small percentage of the population we cannot justify building out a system to accommodate them when you know we have so much uh, opportunity for efficiency and 
and so forth with what the masses are doing and, and so forth. So that's ten, that tends to be our focus. Now blockchain is very promising technology and my team is following it closely because they're, as, I, as I've said repeatedly, Treasury is very, a very technology intensive discipline. And so blockchain is, is a hot topic for us and we follow it closely. Where we'll see it and where we'll see the rubber hit the road. I mean, we're very, if uh, blockchain were a baseball game, we're in the first inning. And we know that it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to bring about some massive changes. But as with the very early stages of the internet, those of you that invested heavily in Netscape stock, very, very long term may be, you know, not so happy because it's hard to pick the winners and losers when you're that early in the game. And that's the case with blockchain, in my opinion. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. I appreciate you being here. Did you have any closing remarks? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for what you do. I, if, you, if you're not offended by the comparison, I would compare you with legislators in that you do extraordinarily important work, work extraordinarily long hours, I know, and you're, there's, there's no economic justification for doing it. I, I know that you're not paid well enough to just, this is a huge, um, a huge public service and an act of, of giving and citizenship for you to serve on this board and I just thank you for all you do. Well, well thank you and it, would it be possible that we could get your um, PowerPoint sent to us either to Lorraine or Scott can get it to Lorraine however I'd be happy to do that. do that so we can put that on board docs. Absolutely. Did you have any? Uh, I'm just going to get CE continuing ed credits for being here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh you better have that documentation. Hey, thank you and take care and appreciate you being here. Thank you. Have a great okay. weekend. All right. Um, this concludes our, our uh, information. So I'm seeking a motion to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn by Board Member Wright. Do we have a second? Lots of seconds. Um, all in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Aye. <laughs> Voting is you nervous.